Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Miranda Janelle, Justin Zellers, Pepper Giese, and our lifetime supporter, Johannes. Thank you for being with us for so long. On this episode of DTNS, TikTok comes to the Vision Pro, but is that enough? Are we finally in a post-web crawling world? And can Meta really control political content, or at least the stuff that you read on its platforms? This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, February 15th, 2024. From Studio Animal House, I'm Sarah Lane. From Columbus, Ohio, I'm Rob Dunwood. From deep in the heart of Texas, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Oh, do we have a show for you all? We're going to talk about, well, Vision Pro stuff. We're going to talk about politics. We're going to talk about how the web has worked for a long time, but maybe won't work anymore. But first, let's start with some quick hits. YouTube announced a remix option to incorporate a music video into a YouTube short. This is going to let users pull from a very big library of music videos, which YouTube can claim is probably the biggest online, but also follows Universal Music Group pulling its song catalog from TikTok a couple of weeks ago. TikTok and YouTube Shorts are kind of going at it these days. Now within Shorts, you can choose a collab tool so the music video and your own video would be side by side. There's a green screen tool that lets you uh, put a music video as the background to your short. The cut tool lets you take a five second clip of a music video and add it to your short. And the sound tool just lets you use the sound from a music video for your own short entirely. Google is launching Gemini 1.5 today and making it available to developers and enterprise users through Google Vertex's AI and AI Studio with a full consumer rollout coming soon. Google is banking on Gemini as both a business tool and personal assistant. Gemini 1.5 Pro is the general purpose model with the new context window for much larger queries with up to 1 million tokens compared to 128,000 for OpenAI's GPT-4 and 32,000 for current Gemini Pro. The information sources say that OpenAI is working on a web search product, partly powered by Microsoft Bing, and aimed squarely at rivaling Google Search. You might say, well, that's kind of big news. Not today, people. OpenAI announced a new text-to-video research project called Sora, S-O-R-A, which is available to some creators and security experts who will red team it for safety vulnerabilities. Now, Sora uses a version of the fusion model that's used by Dolly and GPT-4, generating a video by starting off with one that looks like static noise and then gradually transforming it to make it a very, very realistic finished product. It can reportedly produce up to 60-second video clips, although if you go to openai.com slash Sora, none of those presentation clips were quite that long. They were impressive, though. Amazon Research has announced that they trained the largest ever text-to-speech model, Big Adaptive Streamable TTS with Emergent Abilities, or Base TTS for short, which they claim contains emergent qualities that help speak even complex sentences naturally. The largest version of the model uses 100,000 hours of public domain speech, 90% of which is English, the remainder in German, Dutch, and Spanish. Chinese automaker BYD, which today I learned stands for Build Your Dreams. Didn't know that before. Go for it's, it. build, it's building a factory in Mexico to help sell more vehicles in the United States and keep prices lower, obviously, because we share a border. BYD is Tesla's biggest rival, with China as its biggest market. It sold 1.4 million hybrids and 1.6 million BEVs in 2023, and it's also in stages of construction in Thailand, Hungary, and Brazil. All right, Rob, let's talk about what's up with the Vision Pro, good and bad. Yeah, can you guys believe that the Vision Pro's only been out for two weeks? Because uh, t tomorrow, Friday, February 16th, it will have been out for 14 days after the official launch of the Vision Pro. And some early adopters of the $3,500 mixed reality headset say they've decided to return them for a full refund. Complaints include that the Vision Pro is too heavy, causes eye strain and triggers motion sickness and headaches. But mostly people say the Vision Pro doesn't offer enough productivity or app experiences relative to the price. Many have returned their Vision Pro say that they'd be willing to try a second edition if it offers more comfort and more application support or even would be willing to repurchase a refurbished unit for a discount oh but then rob they're going to miss tiktok's native vision pro app 
which was announced and launched today. TikTok talked about it last month, so this wasn't a huge surprise, but today's the day. The interface, which I've tried, because I've got a Vision Pro here in my studio, looks uh, like the iOS counterpart. I'm going to assume the Android app counterpart as well. So it, it's kind of full screen. You're flipping between anybody that you're following or anything on the For You uh, experience. Um, but it's, it's all kind of right there. It has a vertically oriented player for videos. You've got like, comment, favorite, and share buttons. That's pretty standard. And then creator profiles are visible on a pane on the right, which is taking advantage of the field of view that you wouldn't get you know, if you were looking at a mobile device. It's also different than the web experience, though. Netflix and YouTube previously opted out of their iPad apps uh, running the Vision Pro. They said, we're not, even doing, we're not doing native Vision OS apps, but we don't even want to opt into the iPad app experience. Although YouTube recently confirmed it is working on a Vision Pro app. It, it, it's at least on its roadmap. All right, so uh, I will tell y'all that TikTok on an Apple Vision Pro is terrifying. And, yep. and it is because hmm. one of the things that the Vision Pro does, I think, the best is immersive video. So, you know, if you're watching a movie, I, I think people, people have, it can dock it for lots of reasons. Vision Pro being heavy, that's true. Eye strain, definitely. Um, headaches, haven't had any of those, but everybody's different. Um, I also think it's a little bit of like a learning curve where your body just gets used to it after a while. But TikTok, TikTok specifically, and maybe it's just because of uh, the, the uh, videos that are served up to me, to have that in an immersive experience is like, oh, I could sit here for the next four to five hours. No mm. problem. And have some fun, but also it's pretty, it's, I mean, immersive is not even the right word for what this is. It's like TikTok in your brain rather than in front of you somewhere on a screen. And I don't know if that's good or bad. I guess it depends on how much you like the platform. Go ahead, Justin. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... As far as TikTok goes, uh, it does seem like that we're in some kind of clockwork orange reality where TikTok is beamed directly into your brain, considering how addictive it is. There are no credits to TikTok if you have ever been on the platform. The infinite scroll is the feature, not a bug. But what I'm fascinated by is this story of people saying, OK, I'm going to return the Vision Pro for a full refund because it doesn't seem like people are particularly upset with the product. They're more upset with the price. And that is something that uh, was obviously a barrier going in and impulse buyers who might have said, uh, I trust Apple. My belief in this company is so much that I'm willing to outlay a, a high end laptops worth of money to buy it, we're left wanting. And that's something that I find fascinating considering I'm a huge Apple fan. This is very much in my wheelhouse. I'm very excited to try this product. And yet, because I am a new MacBook away from my own uh, uh, you know, life cycle of products, I haven't got it. So I think there's a, a couple of things. Um, that are happening right now. I think a lot of people who are returning it, that was always the plan. You have folks who they haven't reached the Marquez Brownlee yet to where Apple sends them one and they can test it out. They <laughs> have to go purchase it and test it out, uh, you know, along with everybody else who purchases it. So I think that a lot of people are returning is okay, two weeks, I had two weeks, let's go ahead and send this back. I do believe, however, that quite a few folks who purchased it, it with the full intention of keeping the device have decided that, okay, I've had it for two weeks almost. What else can I do? And yeah. if, you know, so I, I have talked to two people in depth about their experience with this. And they say that the, the video, uh, Sarah, you are co-signing this, that it is so immersive. It, there's nothing they've ever seen like it. And if that is your use case, if that is what you want, if you are on planes or trains where you can wear this thing all the time and just watch video after video after video, then this is your device. But when it gets to, uh, okay, what else do I do with it? It's kind of, they're, they're at a loss for, uh, okay, I'm not sure what else I'm supposed to do because I'm not going to talk to people with this thing on. I'm not going to have people over to the house and they're watching the TV and I'm watching it in, in, in my headset. It's just kind of, 
a, a thing of where, oh, you know, if I'm working on my MacBook, that's kind of cool, except for after 90 minutes, my neck starts to hurt. So I think that there is some validity to the concerns of people who are returning it. And Justin, to your point, it is absolutely, it's, it's just, it's really expensive. I mean, this, this thing is a, it is, it, it is a high end MacBook at that, you know, at that point. I mean, point. I'm, I'm sort of casually in the market for a new television right now. Um, I listen to everything that Robert, Robert Aaron ever tells me about which television to buy. And of course, the best ones are sort of in this price range. For, for the size that I would be looking for, you know, 75 inch type thing. So I think like, okay, with the Vision Pro in, uh, let's say a family setting, right? You've got, you know, a bit guest bedroom type thing. That is something that somebody can watch a bunch of content on for roughly the same price as a really nice television. Okay, I mean, a little bit of a stretch, but if that was all it did, if you had the money, I think it would be worth it. What most people don't have is is the money, or they don't think that it's worth it. And it's also, you know, it, yeah, it comes with all of this, well, it's not really meant to be used by the whole family. In fact, it, you can't do it that way. You have to keep wiping it and, and setting up new, um, new uh, uh, um, accounts because everybody's eyes are different, right? You know, and the eye tracking is a huge part of this. But... But yeah, it's 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 a tough sell. It really is. And the, the whole the whole TikTok coming to Vision Pro, YouTube will eventually. By the way, you can access a lot of things using the Safari browser on the Vision uh, Pro using Vision OS, just like you could on any mobile device. So it's not as if you have all this like blacked out part of the internet that you can't access. But it is it's tough. And I will say. I've not. I've never had the eye strain problem, which I never really had with the MetaQuest either. Um, I've had some sort of like, oh, it's a little smudgy type thing, you know, where you have to clean your glasses. Um, I think that's that's pretty par for course. But I did after watching TikTok for a while this morning, and maybe it's just because my brain felt extremely fried because I watched too many Get Ready with Me videos. Uh, I uh, I. I felt a little eye strain. Headache, not not so much, but eye strain, yes. Can I get a, one, one last thing on this going out? Uh, I am shocked that Apple didn't have something like Tilt Brush, which was a really huge moment for a lot of these immersive VR apps where you could do a thing that you had never really done before and use 3D space in the way that those apps did. Something like that for Apple Vision to just like have a, a killer thing that you could do immediately, I think would have went a long way to get people over that two-week hump. So let's change gears a little bit and let's talk about something completely unrelated to the Vision Pro, robots.txt files. So there's an interesting article on The Verge, which essentially is asking if it's time to move beyond robots.txt for determining what can and cannot be crawled on the internet. Robots.txt is a text-based file sitting at the root of most websites that purely on goodwill for the past three decades has determined what could and could not be crawled, primarily directing search engines on how they can scan websites for search. The article goes into detail about how robots.txt works, why it came about, and why there wasn't or how there was an unofficial agreement i'll let you crawl my content if you let me get some of your traffic but with the onside of data hungry llms that the agreement really isn't working much anymore unscrupulous ai companies flat out ignore robust that text that is not a legal document and llms rarely send traffic back to websites so my question for you guys is it time to move on from the nearly 30 years old robots.txt file sounds that way uh i I have not, I mean, I understand how robots.txt works, but I, I hadn't really thought about the fact that this is all just a lot of, you know, handshake, goodwill, you know, let's, let's do each other a solid, everybody wins type of, you know, the sort of back end of the internet that some people work on all the time, but many people never think about because they're not writing code um, and not publishing websites. The idea that AI is like, no, don't care that's you know you're not going to take us to court over this um i'm surprised it didn't happen a long time ago really uh, look 
no trespassing signs are great when you are only dealing with the people in your neighborhood. No trespassing signs are not great when you are talking about aerial photography for an entire county. And that's what we're looking at in the difference between search engines and LLMs. Uh, is there a method by which people should be able to say that if I am publicly available on the internet, you should not be able to train your AI on my content in a perfect world? Yes. Is that hard to enforce? Also, yes. Uh, I, I think that this is just a reality of when technology moves forward. I mean, how would that be enforced? Even if everyone agreed, or at least, you know, people who... How, 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 is it enforceable, how is it enforceable to have somebody not take satellite or aerial photographs of your property? It's hard. Yeah, right. I, like, I, you I, can take them to court afterwards, but yeah. you can't stop them from doing it. From doing it. I think that copyright lawyers are going to get involved in, in a big way in this and figure, okay, what can we enforce based off the laws that we already have? And then you'll start to see lobbyists in, you know, trying to get lawmakers to make new laws. But the, the big deal here is that, as we said earlier, there, there, was a, there was a handshake. There was an unwritten rule that you just follow this, just be a good citizen. But also, if you scan my website, if you crawl my content for your search engine, when people search and find it on your search engine, you send the traffic back to me and that's what's not happening with these llms they scan your content and they train their ai and the goal for the you know for that ai company is that you never have to go to a search engine they are in essence the search engine they get the advertising dollars they get the money from people who have pro accounts they are ultimately going to uh, profit off of other entities content and that's where everyone has such a big problem with it these days uh, the, the reality of this is, is that the Internet is still we're, we're still in, in, in the Deadwood, Dakota territory times of the Internet. And <laughs> yes, it's yes. hard. It, it's hard to think of that in our perspective, because many of us have been around here for decades. Right. But at the same time, it takes time for civilization to build on top of something that was very, very rough land before we started settling it. And and the fact that we are still dealing with essentially gentlemen's agreements on stuff like this that are multi-billion dollar industries means that when something that supersedes that comes along, we have to understand that there's just going to be a different way of going about it. At a certain point, the big boys are going to move in. I mean, I guess that or you know, laws get rewritten so that the, the internet can't the, the, be there crawled were no laws the way here that, before. You know, yeah. there, there were no laws before. So it's like, you know, we've got to look at laws and see, does anything apply? But this is not just for the LLMs. This, the developers uh, are, are saying, how can we get past robots tax? You've actually got content creators that are saying now that we would like some more detailed controls over with both what is controlled and how it's actually used. Because robots tax is basically you can or you cannot. There's not a lot of gray area in that. And uh, Google, a few years back they made an effort that didn't really go anywhere about the robots exclusion protocol an official formalized standard and i think that that's starting to get a little bit more eyeballs on it because it's like okay can we create a standard that determines how you pull data is that data something that you can charge for is it data that has to be free do you have to pay us for it i think that they're trying to figure out how all this works because now a lot of dollars are involved so what do you want to hear us talk about on the show? One way to let us know is in our subreddit. Submit stories and vote on them over at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Meta's head of Instagram and threads, Adam Masseri, announced in a series of posts that both platforms would clamp down on political content. He said Meta wants to avoid proactively amplifying political content from accounts you don't follow. Masseri added that the company wants to avoid recommending political content and that our goal is to preserve the ability for people to choose to interact with political content while respecting each person's appetite for it. Uh, the Indian newspaper The Hindu also notes that around half the world's population has elections this year. So kind of a big year for political content, including the U.S. presidential election, uh, which, Justin, I know you're following quite closely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. The Hindu added concern that the flow of misinformation will increase as the funding diminishes. So what do we think Meta's play is here? 
Well, Meta's play is to try to not be the center of something that affects an election. And I don't know whether or not they are going to succeed. The reality of this is that they want to stay off the radar of governments that regulate them. Most recently, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg was called before Congress amongst a lot of different social media companies. And for various different reasons that we actually covered on this show, he had to get up and Im- apologize to activists that were behind him. In this case, not about anything political, but about whether or not Instagram does harm to young people, specifically young girls. They want to avoid that. And I think the theory of the case for them is that the more we amplify political content, the more that people who are in politics will be incentivized to criticize us. I'm here to tell them that this is never going to stop. There will be something that is uh, political that will get through their uh, uh, filters and they will eventually have to deal with it. It, it. This is about how we interact with each other in social media, not about whether or not a, a certain political thing is being pushed forward uh, more than something else. Although certainly those debates rage. I look at this and I see what Meta is trying to do. And, and, and it makes sense at the service when you when, when you just when you hear the words that they're saying that we're going to, uh, you know, keep people from seeing political content. But what comes to mind for me is that that's all that's all cool. And so I start to think about, well, who determines what content is political? So clearly, when we're talking about elections and politicians and stuff like that, well, that's political content. But what is it? You know, what is it when you just have someone who says something like, well, Um, I have to sign a form to allow my child to hear a book written by someone that's African-American in their school because of how the, you know, how the school system is. That's probably political, but is it really is, you know, were they really making a political statement or were they just asking a question to talk about something that their kid is going through at school? And I don't trust Meta or anyone for that matter to get those kind of conversations right. So I just want to see how bad at this are they going to be. Yeah, it does seem to me that uh, threads, uh, whether it's posturing or, you know, or or all um, very deliberate, um, trying to roll out the social network um, in stages. Um, uh, You know, with with uh, features being added, but not right out of the gate. Um, um, Threads was pretty bare bones um, and still is if you compare it to something like X um, or a lot of other social networks, even those owned by Meta. This feels like it, it, it for you know the community who's like, is Threads the place for me? And I'm talking about Threads specifically, not Facebook or Instagram. Then if you're like, well, you know, we, we kind of keep politics out of it over here on Threads. People go, oh, OK, I like that. I don't want you know this stuff amplified that I either don't agree with or is uh, bad information or what have you. That all sounds great, but I think you know Justin, the point you're making is how, how can you have a social network that is that behaves this way where you would not see stuff that you don't agree well, with. And how does it scale, really? I mean, let's be honest. That's well. What I mean, want. for for in Threads' case, they are essentially seeding the concept of news to X if this is their actual way that they look to do it, because especially in a year like 2024, that is what news is. If you're going to look at the amount of the most trafficked headlines by the end of the year, I'm going to guarantee you that probably the top 20 are going to be in some level related to politics either tangentially or directly. So you are saying to the service that you are looking to replace, congratulations, we're not competing with your killer feature, for which I'm sure X is thrilled. But that's because threads isn't what matters for Meta. Facebook is what matters for Meta. Instagram is what matters for Meta. Advertising is what is what matters for Meta and lack of regulation or malicious regulation. But I do want to talk to Rob's point real quick because it is an extraordinarily thorny issue. What I've always said when it comes to content moderation, it is a hashtag hell portal, hashtag portal to hell. You are always going to be wrong no matter what. And you brought up a great analogy in terms of uh, uh, the the issues with schools and public libraries, something that the, the, the story that you're referencing was in Miami-Dade County where 
they are uh, complying with a state Florida law that the state says they didn't need to go as far as they did with. The reason why is because you have a public resource that anybody who is tangentially involved with it can file a complaint on. That creates an extraordinarily messy situation where a common uh, area is restricted in a lot of ways that many people don't agree with. If you're then going to take a top-down approach to something like that, it gets even messier on a private uh, area. And, and if you are not doing it from the community out and instead doing it from the admin level down, I think this social media era that we have seen has shown, boy, is there a billion ways to go wrong and almost no ways to go right. So separately from the information reports that Meta is cutting back on funding to news organizations that fact check posts on WhatsApp while simultaneously rolling out new features to allow larger groups on the platform. So we just want to mention that that's that's kind of a kind of kind of a weird thing that they're going to move more into WhatsApp, but they're going to moderate WhatsApp less at the same time while they're saying they're going to do all this moderation in threads. I just big I election that, year. I, I find big that election year. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see what's in the mailbag today. Curious about which places you can fly to from any airport? You might say, well, what, you know, if I go to, I don't know, Phoenix or whatever, where am I going to get? Chris Christensen has a great tool for you. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. This resource today is not necessarily a must-have, but it is a fun resource, and it's flightconnections.com. If you go to flightconnections.com and you put in an airport, you can see all the different places that you can fly to from that airport on a beautiful map. And if you put in two cities, you can see all the routes in between those two airports. And I find it useful to just get an idea of what kind of flights might be available to get, for instance, from here to Casablanca, which I'm flying to in April, or from Marrakesh back to San Francisco. And so it's a fun tool, flightconnections.com. And this is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Oh, man. I want to go to Marrakesh. That sounds, yeah. That sounds yeah. really cool. But, yes, this is uh, – th I've actually used this. I don't, I don't know if you all have uh, before, but um, it sometimes is a good just sort of like if I get to this airport, maybe I'm – trying to save a little bit of money by using uh, various airlines to get somewhere. Um, it's very helpful. It looks like the map that uh, on the back of the, the little flyer that I used to uh, busy myself with before smartphones, where, where it would just show you <laughs> everywhere that the airline flew. It's awesome. I still do that. <laughs> I just look at it. Yeah. Oh, look at all the places I could go. All right. What else we got in the mailbag, Rob? So Rob, and that's Rob with one B, that's not me, wrote in, I loved hearing about tech services in Africa. Tech news is so U.S. based, and as a U.S. resident, I really hear about these types of international topics. I would love to hear more like this a few times a month. I know I might be hard to... I know it might be hard to find and present well, but I really like the show Max topic. Thank you for great coverage. So, yeah, that's uh, about uh, how Netflix is not killing it in the continent of Africa like we like it is kind of everywhere else. Not as much as show Max is not and Amazon, much, yeah. a distant third. Yeah, we talked about uh, that on the show yesterday. And uh, Rob, thank you for noting that because we do try to keep the show as international as we can because we know that people are listening worldwide and watching at times. And yeah, thanks for that. Good stuff. Uh, keeps us on our toes. Thanks to you, uh, Justin Robert Young, for being with us today. What's going on in your world? Oh, baby. We got a lot of stuff uh, politically. The primary calendar heats back up next week, and I will be down in South Carolina for it. So follow Politics, Politics, Politics back on the campaign trail next week. And patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. We'll talk about New York City's lawsuit against TikTok, Meta, Snap, and YouTube for the sake of the children. Oh, we got to save the children. Uh, we also have to save you from not watching the show live or listening if you want to, because it happens at Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. You can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking about pass keys. What's good, what's bad, and what's in between with Patrick Norton joining us. Talk to you then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. 
Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>